Thanks, Marco. So Upfield is in the business of helping companies grow. And the way we see doing that is by opening up the sports category. Uh, Marco mentioned that there are partnerships throughout Major League Baseball, the NFL, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of close to $150 million a year in sponsorships so that they can get their brand and more importantly, their product in front of sports fans. Uh, we understand that consumer space. And what we know about sports fans is that they also care about issues. And for our conversation today, sustainability, uh, those social responsibilities of brands and companies to check the box with sports fans, they see that at the stadium. More so than ever today, uh, food and beverages being sourced locally, uh, there is a cost of entry into getting in front of um, those catering companies, those concessionaires, and there's quite a few sports fans. In fact, 60% of Americans identify themselves as a sports fan. And what we know about that is, the question was brought to us earlier today is, how do we get uh, to the consumer? Whose responsibility is that? Uh, at Upfield, we believe that the farmer is the most important piece of all of that. In conversations last night with JP and, and Sean, uh, you know, I believe, when we believe, that that is really the trust agent. That is who the consumer wants to hear from. Um, and we not, we've got some data on that. Um, I'm going to kind of check, check into four main, main gaps that have really led to this ideology. And number one, and we've talked about several of these things already today, the communication gap. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, and it's confusing. Brands are talking confusing language. Um, labels are confusing. What, is this, what does GMO mean? What does locally sourced mean? There's all of these terms that we in here kind of have as a nomenclature. But the consumer, um, they speak a very different language. And so we see that gap in communications. Um, the perception gap, we've talked about that today as well. What's actually happening on a farm is not what consumers think is happening on a farm. What a consumer thinks um, relative to sustainability is not necessarily in line with what farmers and ranchers um, you know, consider sustainable. The technology gap was a big part of our conversation throughout this day. There's technology happening. In fact, part of my earlier story when I have more time is this is uh, a grain elevator in my hometown. Uh, my roots are in agriculture. Uh, this was a flour mill bought by my grandfather in 1942, converted over to a grain elevator. When I was a kid, I used to drive across the Midwest with him through Iowa, through Kansas, through all of these states, and we would park the Suburban and get out and he would walk through the fields. And that's how he got his information. That's how he would buy grain for the farm in Ohio. And so in a lot of instances, that's still the case. What people understand about agriculture, the things that we do on the farm, consumers have no idea and they're scared of it. Um, antibiotics, they don't think about antibiotics as helping a sick animal. They think of it as being something bad for their body. And so how do we communicate to all of these organizations or all of these consumers uh, we believe that sports is a great platform for that. And finally, as we all know, the average age of a farmer is much older than it's ever been. The farm kid has grown up not going back to the farm. And so all the latchkey kids, all the millennials, all of us that have grown up knowing a farmer, or at least knowing a family of farmers, no longer have that point of reference. And so they're getting information from the Google machine, they're getting information from whomever, in fact, who they're getting information from is that entity that's smart enough to get on the first page of Google, right? And so if you have that information um, and you have that accessible to someone who's looking, right, if it's interesting, if it's relevant information and you're able to get there first, which is what I think a lot of our competitors did, frankly, the, the you know, the, um, the activists and some of these socially charged entities that have a agenda, um, they're pretty smart when it comes to digital media. They're pretty smart and they kind of beat us to the punch. And so now we've got to come from the third page of Google to the top of the Google search. And again, we believe that sports is an ideal opportunity for that because as we'll see here, um, since 2007, which is really when a lot of these topics started coming into the mainstream. Right? Agriculture has taken a big, I think, jump in the last decade or so, just in having the access of social media and that being such a driver of everything that we do. Um, you'll see the spending, right? And this is $22.5 billion a year being spent in sponsorship and entertainment. And that's being driven by the 
from the top 100 brands, and here's, I think, a key takeaway. Of the top 100 brands spending money in sponsorship and entertainment, not a single agriculture brand comes up on that top 100. So the correlation here is if we're spending more as an economy in sports in order to reach that consumer, in order to reach that fan, uh, but agriculture is not participating, at least not putting the farmer voice in that participation, and we see a more of a divide between what's happening in agriculture and what consumers understand, I think you can correlate that as we spend less and spend, ne spend less attention to where consumers are spending their leisure time, right, we're getting them in a position where now they have this very rigid structure of how they get information versus being seen at a ballpark or at a stadium in conjunction with a dairy association or the beef council in cargo, for example. I love the example of um, having a hamburger of minor league baseball, right? There's 212 communities um, that have minor league baseball across this country. They all serve food and beverage. Uh, the average uh, mom who attends a minor league baseball game is four times more likely to shop at Walmart. It is, it's us, it's rural America, and they're not getting this access to information from, from the sports world or from the agriculture world. And so what we've derived is that as this spending continues to grow, and it will, as you can see from this trend, we're spending more and more time in sports and entertainment. It's become more part of our daily lives. Again, 60% of Americans identify with sports. And so a quick example of how we've been able to close the loop and what we've been able to see, the Sacramento Kings are a good example of an NBA team who are sourcing 100% of their food and beverage for concessions um, from within 100 miles of their stadium. And so that's a food trend and a beverage trend that's not unique to any particular city, but we're, see we're seeing it everywhere. And then the other one that we were able to do was with the Cleveland Browns in the NFL. The National Dairy Council aligned uh, the Cleveland Browns uh, food waste, so taking food scraps and food waste from Cleveland Brown Stadium and aligning it with a, a methane digester. So we're taking manure from a dairy farm, adding food waste to it and creating energy for the community. What that did was gave us a platform to talk about manure management with the community, to do something positive with it, and instead of you know, this new concept and this, this thing right, happening that no one understood in Cleveland, uh, now we had a platform to talk about it in a friendly environment where, you know, if there's something that a community is able to do with sports is bring teams and people together, left or right, wrong or, you know, indifferent, sports still can be that emotional attachment that people have that aligns them together. So we'll talk more about it.